Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Corley from Figure It Out Productions. The following video is a video of some kind, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Figure It Out cast for May 2024. I am your host, Adam Korlick, and I am joined by Joseph Tamburino. Welcome back, buddy. Hi, Adam. I'm glad to be here again. Appreciate it, as always. Uh, before we get too far into this, of course, this is a Patreon-funded podcast, uh, so we appreciate everybody's support out there. You can keep the channel running. You can uh, just support us. You can get early access to videos. You can get shout-outs. You can pick subjects, and you can even be on the show just like Joseph is. So, as always, we appreciate that. All the information to do that is in the description, along with things like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, Spreadshirt, the Travel Channel. I appreciate the support on those platforms. Now let's go ahead and get into it. So... Joseph, uh, the first subject we're going to talk about here was actually one of yours, because of course you get to pick one, and it seemed like the most obvious thing in the world to talk about, which was, what exactly has been going on with Xbox lately? Uh, would you like to set this up? Yeah, sure. Alrighty, so I'm sure everyone everyone who would care to listen to this podcast is already well aware of some things that happened with Xbox recently. Specifically, the fact that they closed a number of their Bethesda studios. Um, specifically, Arcane Austin, who made Redfall and Prey. Um, Tango Gameworks, who made Hi-Fi Rush and the Evil Within games. That was Along also with some other ones, like Alpha Dog Games, who apparently made a mobile game called Mighty Doom. And Roundhouse Studios, which is apparently not shut down, but is now currently just basically eaten by Zenimax Online Studios to go work on the Elder Scrolls Online. Yeah, uh, f for those who missed it, I did a video entirely on this, and I definitely made a mistake there in that part uh, about Roundhouse. They were just moved over to Zenimax. The interesting thing about Tango, it was the only Japanese studio owned by Microsoft, and they still shut them down. Which I think mm -hmm. is like, wow, okay. But anyway, uh, since I've made a video already, I will say my piece again, but uh, I would very much like to hear yours. Okay. Um, so, like, obviously, there's... there. I have a couple of mixed feelings on this, like, specifically. And I want to get it right out of way work. Right out of way. No matter what Microsoft says to justify it, Doing this, like, pretty much immediately after buying Activision Blizzard just is a very bad look. Especially considering most of these studios were also recently acquired by when they were acquired Bethesda, which was only a couple of years ago. Um, but, there, I mean, I know we're, we keep saying that Microsoft has infinite money to burn, basically. It could do whatever they can to make their gaming division... Keep going, but as you pointed out on your video, that's not actually the case. Like, Xbox still has higher-ups at Microsoft that they need to pay attention to. And you brought up, like, the fact that the Activision Blizzard acquisition was a lot more painful for them to do than what they were probably anticipating. Like, they were probably figuring, oh, it's video games, no one's going to care. Why would the FTC give a shit? And then... Mm -hmm. They basically, what, spent like a year like having to like fight it in order to actually buy them? Was it? Yeah, I, I, that's correct. And they also had to go through legal issues with a bunch of different countries. Um, forgive me, do you remember what Activision was sold for? I'm going to type uh, it. A ridiculous amount of money, but no, I don't remember specifically. All right, so Activision ultimately was sold for $75.4 billion dollars. Okay, now I doubt that was entirely cash. It was probably largely Microsoft stock, etc. But if we look at what was Bethesda sold for, it was seven point five billion. It was literally ten times more expensive to get Activision than it was to get Bethesda in a difference of only three years. Mm -hmm. That should tell you a lot. Not to mention that didn't include the external costs because Microsoft had to pay, no doubt, a ton of lawyers to deal with all of yeah. this legal hassle, um, which that had to eat up a massive amount of money. So I wouldn't be that. I mean, this I don't know these numbers. It wouldn't shock me entirely if the Activision of Acqui uh, acquisition of Activision, hard sentence to say, cost them around a billion dollars in assets or a hundred billion dollars in assets. Uh, when they were probably anticipating closer to like ten, would be my guess. Is they probably so they probably paid, you know, like 
massively overpaid for the the system uh, for Activision, and um, I I guarantee that caused them some reconsiderations. Uh, it also, like you said, is just kind of a bad look, and they didn't even really get out of it what they wanted because I mean. I speculate that the primary reason they wanted Activision was uh, over Call of Duty rights. I know people have also pointed out that they were also very interested in the uh, what is it, King Studios, who does like Candy Crush and all that, because it would help them get more integrated with the mobile division, etc. Um, but regardless, well, I, I think Microsoft itself wanted King for that more than Xbox specifically. But yeah, yeah. but. I guess my point is this acquisition, it, it probably was just a lot more damaging to them than they anticipated. And I, it, the whole situation to me looks like some, I'm just going to say it's some bean counters. were basically saying like, uh, Tango works didn't make any money because their only game was hi-fi rush and it didn't make any money. Ignoring the fact that the reason it didn't make money is because you forced it onto game pass where no one would pay for it. About um, that. Um, apparently, yeah, like there were tweets where from Xbox people say, saying that no, X, uh, Hi-Fi Hi Rush did much better than we actually thought it was going to do, and was like we were happy with it with like in by every metric imaginable. So um, I assume the metric you're referring to is the three million players metric that is about Hi-Fi Rush. I, I just so, remember what the tweet I saw said. Right. I don't so know what, but they didn't say what metrics. They just said right, by so, every metric that it did well which is okay. probably why they put that one on playstation 5 honestly. sure uh that's a possibility but uh, there is a bit of a, a spin campaign with the way um microsoft owned games works on game pass because they always spin it as successful because either you made a ton of money off of a particular game and they talk about sales if a lot of people play it they talk about a lot of downloads they talk about a lot of players but they always find because if you're giving it away for free the numbers will always look better basically if it sells really well that doesn't necessarily mean it has the biggest user base but you can say it sold really well if you gave the game essentially away for free you can say oh so many people played it but it didn't necessarily make any money um hi-fi rush seemed to kind of fall into that category and it is also the kind of game i would expect to do better on playstation and nintendo hardware because it's obviously a very japanese game given that it is japanese um and i do th i think that could have sold better on you know the xbox ecosystem except they just kind of didn't really allow it to but that's just yeah. one example i mean they didn't market it much either it was basically it was it was shadow dropped onto game pass exactly it's it just kind of happened out of nowhere. Um, and that's that's the thing with, with Xbox lately, is they're just making a lot of strange choices, and I hit up on this in my video. It does feel like you have, essentially, you have Sarah Bond, you have Matt Booty, and you have uh, Phil Spencer, who all are in significant positions, but there doesn't seem to be any sort of clear direction on where they're going with it, because I think they all have bosses at Microsoft proper, who's basically like, change the strategy uh and they don't know what the strategy is yet and i think that part of this reshuffling was probably in an effort to in the short term eat some money back or cut some costs more accurately and it just looks really bad but that's mm -hmm. that's just my take i mean again i already did my video so i'm curious more on what you have to say about it though right now like, like we mentioned like the activision blizzard acquisition that hurt a lot more than they were expecting it to but there's also some other stuff that happened. I'm pretty sure that they were expecting to be able to like significantly jack up Game Pass by now, and Game Pass has not been making money for them. So, and they haven't gotten enough of the users that they wanted to be able to do that, I'm assuming. There's also the fact that there were a bunch of games that came out that didn't do well. Like I, I'm sure like Microsoft, didn't, for whatever reason, did not expect Redfall to fail like it did. They expected Starfield to do much better than it did. Like, people are not happy with Starfield. Like, I love it, but I also hadn't played a Bethesda game since, like, Fallout 3. Um, and I also hadn't played anything like No Man's Sky. So, the, there are two groups of people who seem to not like Starfield. The people who were expecting it to be, like, No Man's Sky, Elite Dangerous, or Star Citizen. And the people who were expecting it to 100% be Bethesda game in space. Which it is, but the formula doesn't actually properly translate. Like, I played a little bit of Fallout 4 recently, and at least as far as, like, all the Bethesda diehards who are complaining about Starfield go, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. I still love Starfield, but I get it. 
So that, uh, like, Starfield is, like, one of those games where they were saying that, yeah, we're expecting to support it for years and have people constantly playing it and with expansions and stuff like that. So that, the reception of that game not going well doesn't help Game Pass. Um, but there's also some other rumors and stuff that I've read specifically about Arcane Austin in regards to Redfall and Tango Gameworks. Um, in the case of the Redfall developer, like, all the people who, like, a lot of the people who made Prey left, left Arcane Austin during the making of Redfall because they hated working on Redfall and it was basically Zenimax Media making them make, yeah, you need a live service game. You guys go make that. And they're like, we, but we want to make immersive sims. We're good at immersive sims. We're your secondary immersive s- s- sim studio. And they were like, when they were happy when Microsoft bought Zenimax, because they were like, oh, good. Microsoft is going to fucking cancel this. And then, you know, Microsoft made them do it. Um, so there was a lot of developer bleed from that. And Tango Gameworks, I, haven't been able to like see like an actual like source on this um but Shinji Mikami the the guy who created the studio after he left Capcom um basically like the director of like the every from like Resident Evil 1 to like Resident Evil 4 he left made to form Tango Gameworks and then they were making games they made Evil Within eventually they made Hi-Fi Rush after Hi-Fi Rush was finished he and supposedly a bunch of people left Tango Gameworks afterwards. So with those two in particular, it's not just a case of, oh, their games didn't sell well. Um, it was also a case of, oh, they also bled developers, so in order to make another game of the quality that they just made or make something better, they also have to hire people and we and we need to stop hemorrhaging money. So it's entirely possible, depending on how valid those rumors are, that the reason both Arcane Austin and Tango got got closed the way they did was just because they needed to basically it's like well they don't have a project that's actively in development right now and in order to make it they have we have to spend more money on them we should just cut our losses especially in the case of tango gameworks which is the only microsoft owned studio that's was headquartered in japan which i bet gives a bunch of headaches as well yeah all right, let me address the first part about Arcane Austin and Redfall. That I actually had heard, and I completely agree with that. I mean, a- a- that game was completely broken, and um, the general consensus is they probably should have canceled it a long time ago when the Microsoft merger occurred. My guess is, um, well, okay, and more accurately, a lot of people have been questioning if Microsoft even has significant quality control in those situations. Like, did they go into that and say, yeah, this game isn't going to work, we should just bail on it? Or did they just say, hey, you know what, this was ZeniMax's financial problem, we'll just give you a little bit more money to finish this up, and then we'll just kind of recoup, recoup the cost, regardless if it's any good or not? Uh, you have to wonder. Um, and I, I guess they were very close to doing another update for that game that would have stabilized it, and I don't know if that update is still going to happen. My guess would be no. There's um, one last update that apparently is going out, but yeah, like DLC for Redfall that, got canceled. Right, so the Redfall update, if I remember correctly, is supposed to at least take the online requirement off. Um, that way that you know the game is a you know, little bit more playable down the road, but you know whatever. Um I don't think too many people are going to care about that particular release. But that that situation makes sense to me. The Tango Gameworks thing, though, I hadn't heard about the talent drain from that studio. That actually would track because it would actually make a lot of sense for them to be like, let's evaluate our studios. It's like we have one Japanese studio and none of the Japanese talent we hired is even there anymore. Do we need this place? Um and I don't know if it's just, like, Japanese people not wanting to work for an American company. I do know that it's illegal for uh, in Japan for Microsoft to buy, like, a Japanese corporation. So they couldn't, say, buy Sony or buy Sega or buy Nintendo or whatever. But a little studio like that you could get away with. But maybe on just an individual level, the people working there just, like... I don't know. I just don't really want to be here doing this. Maybe there's something about that ecosystem they don't like. Yeah. I've always said there's something about working at the Xbox division that seems to kind of drain talent. Like, look at Rare. I mean, Rare is like the earliest example once Microsoft had the Xbox division where they were buying up a major studio that was super successful, like back in the 
Nintendo 64 era. And then, you know, Microsoft turns around and buys them and says, okay, Rare is with us, and they're going to make things like Conquer for the Xbox. And they made, like, a couple of games, and then they just vanished almost entirely. And they've been essentially irrelevant until the Sea of Thieves. Uh, and it, I think it's usually just because talent drain. But, you know, I don't work for them, yeah. so I can't really say. But it, it, does, it does seem to be a common trend, that there's just something about people not wanting to work under the xbox umbrella and i i just i don't know what that is and i don't know if there is a way to know that but it does speak to massive structural issues where they're basically acquiring all these studios gaining all these ips and then just kind of doing nothing with most of them i mean i've never sat down and done this but i'm sure you and i could we could look at a list of every single character that microsoft owns from video game history like they own conquer but they don't do anything with them. They own the call out uh, the Call of Duty characters. They own obviously Fallout, Elder Scrolls characters. They own Crash Bandicoot and Spyro the Dragon, and they don't do anything with any of them. Granted, some of them well, are more recent. Oh, well, those but, are like very new. So yeah, exactly. I know. But my point is, like, it has to be insane to think how many characters and IPs they have that they just don't do anything with. I mean, Sega gets a bad rap for that, but like, I would argue Microsoft's way worse about it. Oh, yeah. Like, at least in Sega's case, it could, you could very argue that, yeah, they have a bunch of IPs, um, but most of the time when they tried to do anything with them, they didn't sell. And when they don't have a system that they need to prop up with new releases, it's harder to justify, like, spending money on the lower earning stuff. Like, back when Sega, like, had a console that they had to run, yeah. I mean, maybe it doesn't necessarily make sense to prioritize to make a game that's not sonic if sonic's what makes you a ton of money but when you have a console you need to have games coming out just to have a perception of you have games on your system exactly if you if you're a third-party developer then you all, your only concern is money or if enough of your devs ha are passionate about an ip enough to just very very want to do it and you want to make sure they don't bail to leave you to make so that they can then afterwards make you the stuff that actually makes money agreed and yeah mike like microsoft's a very interesting case because if they were if any other video game manufacturing company ever attempted any of this they would have been belly up years ago like the only reason any of this has worked for them is literally because they are the most valuable corporation in the history of the world and so they've been able to just eat consistent loss for two decades and it's never really mattered. So I don't know, like, what do you think the future of this situation is? Cause it does come off. Like they don't really have a plan. They are going to kind of run on autopilot for a bit. And then who knows, like who knows what any of this does? Yeah. I honestly don't know. Like, I know we used to think that what Microsoft was doing was like going to work with like basically becoming a brand, a brand for like video games on like everything and trying to move away from the Xbox actual like hardware. But now I'm not sure if they're going to be able to make that work because a well, like you said, because everything like this is like, oh cool, Microsoft's coming out with a cool awesome game. Shame that they're going to shit can the developer as soon as it's done. <laughs> yes, like. Um... Yeah, I, like I this is know. this is this actually like brings up like something semi related, um, but like and by semi related I mean like sort of in tone, but not really like Microsoft. Like Paradox Interactive is like a publisher slash developer who makes a lot of like Forex games. They make Stellaris. They make Crusade of Kings. Um, they recently came out with a Civ like game called Millennia. I bought that day one. Was playing it. But then at, like, the day after that, like, another one of their titles that they were, that they published, Star Trek Infinite, which was basically Solaris, but, but what if it was Star Trek themed? Yeah, they said that, yeah, we're not, we're stopping development on that, like, after six months, and that actually killed my desire to actually play Millennia, because I'm like, well, is this game even going to still be supported in six months? So it's, and this was a game I bought already, too. So it's like, you know... So, like, when companies do stuff like that, it's like, if you're not going to support what you put out, why should I buy anything new you put out? 
Yeah, that's that's fair. Buyer confidence is important. That's also why I like my retro gaming, because I didn't expect my Sonic the Hedgehog 2 Genesis cartridge to be supported 40 years later. It just still is. It just works. Uh, but that's me. That's just be you know, being nostalgic for right. a simpler time in that regard. I recognize that's not the world we live in. But, um, okay, so... Uh, you mentioned something earlier that I think is worth circling back around to, which was the fact that they, I, I, I'm going to almost call it the failure of Game Pass from a financial perspective. Like you said, and I know you and I have had discussions on this on the show before, which was Game Pass absolutely needs to raise its price to be sustainable for them. And we kept saying, like, you know, whenever they did raise it, it was always by something nominal, like a dollar or whatever, um, even though that wasn't going to make a huge difference in the long run. Uh, and I think that they were like, we need to do that sooner than later, but they're just not in the position where they can actually get away with it. The only way you get away with that is if enough people are on board that they kind of consider the service, you know, irreplaceable. And in my video that I, I know, again, you saw, I kind of think they might switch it, switch to, at least for a time, the Amazon Prime model where you subscribe to the service for, you know, a basic fee and then you get some content with that included. But then there's like, you know, extra content you have to pay more money for. So like uh, if you were to subscribe to Game Pass under that model, you'd pay, you know, your whatever it is, $15 a month or whatever. And then uh, you would get a whole ton of games on there that are accessible. But then there's some new AAA game and you only get that if you either you want to rent it, you can rent it for like two days or something or like 30 hours of gameplay or whatever they consider fair for like you know an extra six dollars and then or you could quote unquote buy it digitally which would not really be buying it but you could do that for i don't know an extra like 15 dollars uh and i think that type of model might be where game pass eventually has to go in order to stay marketably viable um because i guess if i were to take one thing away from all of this is that the slumbering giant that was Microsoft, who for the last 23 years has not really cared if the Xbox division was profitable or not, may finally have gotten tired of the fact that not only is it not profitable, but it's ridiculously hemorrhaging cash. Um, and yeah. so that that might be what's going on now. Probably. I mean, when you think about it, like, I'm sure that if it was still hemorrh if it was hemorrhaging cash, but they were literally like the top of the game industry or whatever, they might feel a little bit differently. Although I'm sure they would still want to actually make money. Um, but speaking of your whole Game Pass going Amazon Prime route thing, they funnily enough they actually sort of did that with Starfield. Like, yeah, Starfield was available on the base Game Pass service, but you could up spend like thirty bucks to upgrade your Game Pass version to, like, the digital deluxe edition with, like, the pre-order DL with, like, the season... Well, with the first expansion, like, pre-ordered, along with a couple of, like, pre-order DLC and stuff like that, and, like, early access to the game for, like, 30 bucks. So they've definitely already started to dip their toe into a model like that. I just don't know how many other games they've actually done it for. Well, that's... that's I'm glad you have that example, because I didn't know that, but that's exactly my point I, I could easily see them going that direction because it's just it's just not viable for them to be able to do that it's been awesome for the customer and i've done videos on this but there's like a triangle of economics where basically you have the creator of something the distributor of something and the uh, consumer of something and only two out of the three can ever win so with game pass uh low prices were good for the customer guaranteed development costs were good for the developer but microsoft the distributor who is losing out on you know they're spending all the money to make a game and they're also not able to take in any revenue because game pass doesn't earn enough they are the loser you can always have two either winning or losing and never all three um and it, eventually the goal of a corporation is to change that obviously so we might be getting to that point but as you said this hypothetically would work if it had absolute domination of the gaming industry, which was likely what they almost anticipated achieving. Um, and 
even a few years ago during the pandemic, that actually seemed a tad more plausible. I mean, if you remember Mm -hmm. during the pandemic, they had just acquired Bethesda and that was like this huge announcement from them. The PS five shortages were insane. The Japanese didn't really embrace the PS five. And in fact, for a time there, they were embracing the Xbox hardware simply because of, uh, you know, game pass and the, the fact that they didn't want to have to deal with going out and getting physical things. But None of that held. That was like a very temporary bubble. And then once the pandemic was effectively over, it was like, okay, business as usual. And part of me wonders if that had anything to do with the division, the decision to go after Activision. Um, I don't really know that, but like I speculate, but I, the one thing I am sure of is that they did not anticipate spending that much on Activision, not only in monetary, but in time. Uh, and effort and not to mention it looked like a pr nightmare for them because every day it was just another story about them being this monopolistic corporation so it's like i could see why that that whole thing was a problem um speaking of activision again i did see a see like a, a video on youtube like right before we started talking about how their plan to put call of duty on game pass has quote leaked which I'm kind of surprised that anyone that game Call of Duty being on Game Pass is at all like a thing that no one was exp- that anyone could think would leak because obviously it's going to be on Game Pass. That's why they bought Activision. Yeah. Um, but uh, this is either going to be a case of they're going to try putting Call of Duty on Game Pass, and it's either going to make e- either it's. It might make it so that people might actually start subscribing to Game Pass in droves again, or it might not work, since, you know, the games are still coming out on PS5, and let's be honest, a lot of the people who play Call of Duty only buy Call of Duty, and only play Call of Duty. Precisely. So So why would they go get a $20 a month subscription to just play Call of Duty? when they can buy it for 70 bucks and have it. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I'm all in favor of um, competition, but competition is actually what's kind of harming them here. If people had less of a choice in how they go getting their Call of Duty, this would obviously work. And I, I had talked about this in the video about how, like, when it comes to Windows specifically, you know, Microsoft dominates the OS industry. I think that we can all kind of agree on that. Um, yeah. You know, you have your token resistance from Apple, but that's they also make their own hardware. So it's like you're getting a completely separate thing. It's Nintendo. They're off in a corner type of logic. But, you know, there's no serious competition from, like, Ubuntu or Linux. I mean, those exist. They are an option. But really, if you're getting into a PC, you're going to get some iteration of Windows. And I think part of the reason they were able to dominate that is simply they were there from the beginning of it. Um, Microsoft just kind of entered too late, like, as far as video game consoles goes, if that was ever the goal, which I don't think, as I said in my video, it no- it wasn't the goal initially. <laughs> the goal was no. just to save the PC. But to utterly dominate video games, you really, in the same way they utterly dominate OSs, you really couldn't have this much competition. Um, and in all their years of doing this, they've never knocked anybody out. Uh, you can argue Sega, but Sega kind of did that to themselves, and really Xbox wasn't announced till they were already leaving anyway. Yeah. So, and Nintendo, keep in mind, like, yeah, yeah, Microsoft was making the Xbox while they were working with Sega, but if Sega managed to keep going with the Dreamcast and just had, like, Microsoft helping with the OS, Microsoft would have been perfectly fine with that and not coming out with an Xbox. Like, Microsoft making the Xbox hardware was literally the last resort they had to actually get into the game console space. Well, like, they, they wanted to... They tried to, like, talk to Sony and Nintendo about making software for their consoles at at one point, at one point, and then they were basically laughed out of the room. But... So, are you not familiar with the story of the time Sega went to Microsoft about all this? Uh, I remember hearing you talk about that right. afterwards, but, like... So- but basically, all right. So basically, what happened is uh, around the time of two thousand, I think it was two thousand or two thousand one, probably more two thousand one. At that point, the Xbox wasn't out, but it was like a known thing that was coming, or potentially coming. Um, Sega did not want to give up on hardware, so it was probably two thousand. It wasn't two thousand one yet. Uh, they went to Microsoft and basically said, like, look, here's what we want to do: um, don't release your own system. 
support the Dreamcast. Just help us ride out this generation. And then next time around, we'll let you guys be involved in hardware and we'll put out the new system uh, in Japan under our name. It'll be under your name or both of our names in here. And it would just be like a big collaborative thing and Sega would do all the exclusivity, etc. cetera. Um, and Microsoft shot that down point blank, basically cons- you know, considering it like eating a tumor at the time. Uh, well, which, to be fair, hindsight, this yeah. was Sega talking to them. Yes. But my point is Microsoft had that option to just be involved and develop software and not have to deal with that. But I'm guessing uh, the reason they didn't do it, aside from the fact they saw Sega as a sinking ship, uh, is that they wanted more control over... um, Uh, being sure what direction that industry went in and if they were partnered with sega they would only be a partner they would not be able to make unilateral decisions that they ultimately did do um and honestly i'm glad they didn't because uh a world where sega was just kind of their puppet would have not been too interesting to me but yeah it's because you got to remember the goal at the time When Microsoft first got into video game consoles, it wasn't to make a video game console. It was to protect the home PC market uh, by keeping Sony and Sega and Nintendo away from it. By basically encouraging people to, you still need a PC, you can't just replace it with a game console. Which, as ridiculous as that might sound, was actually a very plausible thing back Mm -hmm. in the late 90s. Um, So, their corporate motivation has changed. Even in the mid 2000s when the ps3 came out yeah like that thing supported that. linux yeah yeah for, for that a was, time anyway yeah i mean yes exactly but i mean i don't think that pcs were under too much of a direct threat from the playstation 3 i think it was more like wouldn't that be cool it's technically supported i oh, yeah. by that point i don't think anybody would have seriously considered being like no no no. i don't have a computer in my house i have a ps3 that's how i browse the internet like i just don't think anybody really would act like that at no. that point but you have to understand to those listening in the late 90s this actually was viable like the the home pc market wasn't nearly as established as it is now anyway so their point is their motives have changed substantially over time uh and it's never just as simple as they were there to make money because if they were they did a horrible job at that since i don't think microsoft has ever yielded a profit in the xbox division uh overall collectively anyway um but yeah so where do you think this all goes like, if I had to ask you right now, just take a shot in the dark, where do you think this goes? I don't... That's the thing. I really don't know. Because it's going to basically depend on where they go with Game Game Pass from here on out. Because, like, like you said, like, like you said, since, A, it's not making money, but they're so invested in that at that point that if they give up on it, then their brand's pretty much dead. So... Yeah. You know, I I guess I sit here and I look like, will Xbox be a thing in five years? And, you know, I sit here and I go, I don't, I honestly don't know. Um, I do think changes are coming. I do think that we're going to get more of like that Amazon Prime model. And I think that's going to be part of some sort of transition to a new model that I don't think they themselves actually have figured out just yet. Um, I still maintain that if they could... They would integrate everything as Xbox as a service onto other devices. And since that hasn't quite achieved its goal yet, they're probably going to stick with the tried and true method of like, hey, we have to announce another system. Otherwise, this will completely tank the brand, even though we don't really want to make another one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they can't not do it because the second they say we're not doing another system, that's it. Market confidence in them is dead forever and doesn't return. Um, so you kind of have to make one out of obligation more than passion. And because they become so bloated in gaming, they're going to have to come up with a completely new strategy, which may actually eventually come land on the, I don't know if we want to be doing this anymore. Let's have a fire sale of our assets in gaming. But then you look at it and you're like, who could conceivably buy any of that stuff? Like, what other video game associated company could just willy-nilly spend $75 billion on Activision assets. Well, it depends on that, how much of Activision assets they're buying, but... Yeah, yeah you're talking like, about splitting it into pieces. My The point I'm trying to make is they own so much gaming content that for them to sell it, they'd have to sell all of it at a ludicrous loss. Oh, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, 
Yeah, and it's and you'd just be selling it to fragments, like whoever's willing to take it. Like, hey, take two. Do you want, you know, part of Activision? Do you want like Treyarch specifically? I don't really care. We'll sell them to you for like a hundred million dollars as opposed to like what it even originally was worth or whatever. I'm just saying Hey Sony, like, do you want Spyro and Crash again? <laughs> yeah, you can actually buy them outright now. We don't care. It's over. But the other problem is and I again I don't you know, I don't work in any of this, but if you were at Microsoft at that point and you decided, hey, we're going to sell this, uh, good luck posturing that in any sort of position of power. Because the second yeah. you announce, like, we're out of games, everybody knows that you'll take any bid. <laughs> like, you won't really care what you're getting back on any of this stuff. So this has become a, you know, this you, you're no doubt familiar with the expression, like, too big to fail when it comes to game mm -hmm. companies and stuff, or companies. This is like... Um, too big to succeed like it can't possibly function it has to fail um which is just kind of bonkers uh but you know i don't know it's i want to believe wholeheartedly that their heart is still in this and they want to do this but i i genuinely think what we're seeing is the realization that a strategy that they've put in for the last what when did game pass come out like 2015 2016 that that seems like it's a little bit early, but it's definitely remember. been quite a few years. Yeah, it's it's. I, I think they were talking about it all the way back in like 2015. I don't think it existed just yet, um, but it's been a while that they've they've had it. Oh, around. 2017. Okay. 2017. Okay. June 2017. So yeah. So it's been about seven years. Uh, by the time most of you are listening to this, it will have been about seven years that game passes around. And I think we're just kind of at the point of realization that from a corporate perspective, their strategy has failed and they might just be tired of dumping cash into it. And Microsoft higher ups are just saying enough's enough. You need to make some changes here. And low hanging fruit is to cut studios that don't yield a profit for X, Y, and Z reasons. Uh, and it's dump some of these completed games we didn't make enough money on onto other platforms so we can bring some revenue back in. We got to try and salvage this would be the best term, I think, while you in the meantime, come up with a new business strategy for how you want to do this. Or as much as I hate to say it, you come up with an exit strategy. Uh, yeah, and I don't I don't know which is which. It, it would be very weird <sighs> for them to fail and give up. But. You know, it's, it is a yeah, like we, we talked about this, like back when we were hearing rumors that, yeah, they might go third party. We were like, who, but that, that will basically leave Sony and Nintendo who will compete, who are basically like at least pretending to compete in two different fields, who are doing two different things. It's like competition at that point is like completely gone. Pretty Cause, much. Because there's, there's no company at all who could take Microsoft's place as the third game console maker. Or no. there's no company that has the money and has the desire to. Like, yeah, the closest, the closest to that, I don't remember the top five valuable companies in the world, but it's all like, I think it's Microsoft, Apple, Google, uh, Amazon. It's all, it's all American companies, but the only one of them that has ever had any significant interest in it is Microsoft. Um, you know, unless Apple yeah. wants to surprise us with the Pippin 2, but my guess is no. Uh, no, so, like... I know Amazon's doing some gaming stuff and like has a couple of game developers, but like Google's not going to do it. Like if they were going to do it, they would they would have kept Stadia around and would have yeah. kept trying to put more money into that. But no, they they killed that when it wasn't working. So they're not going to jump into making a game console now. And even if they wanted to, no one would trust that it would be around in a year. Yeah, as much as I like Google and I love their phones, like I have a Google Pixel, their support structure does kind of suck. Like they'll give you like two years of updates and then they're like, okay, we're done. They, they quit projects very easily. Um, I'll give Microsoft some credit there. Like they support their stuff forever. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And uh, you, you got to give them props there. Um, uh, but anyway, that, that's, I think we've kind of set our piece on this, which is not to say all doom and gloom because we don't, nobody really knows. We're just trying to see, I guess if I were to consolidate all this, it really just seems like they are going through restructuring while they try to figure out what their future is. And I do not believe there's some grand plan they haven't revealed on us just yet. I think that they legitimately don't know what to do. Yeah, no, th their grand plan was what they have been attempting and didn't work. So now yeah. they're. Now, yeah, they are scrambling. 
Yeah. To, and so we'll just see what, what comes of that. Um, but all right, let's move on. So Joseph, thank you very much for that subject. And hopefully you guys also saw my video on it so we could chat more about it, leave comments. Let's talk. But uh, next up, we have a, a lighter topic here. Uh, this comes from Spencer Perrier, who is a backer, who is at the tier in which he can actually pick a subject. Actually, to tell you the truth, he's actually at the tier where he could be on the show every single episode, and he has never once wanted to do it. So I just appreciate his support. But all the same, he uh, does actually pick a subject, and this is what he wanted to go with. Uh, what if uh, any game? What if any game franchise is so sacred that we should never remake it? Uh, I guess to rephrase that slightly, is there any game franchise you can think of that you think is so special, so culturally significant that we shouldn't touch it? And while you think about that for a second, I'll kind of elaborate by being, you know, when I first heard this question, I thought, oh, there must be. And then I started to think about like movies, like there's movies you never touch. Like we're never going to really remake the back to the future movies because you really shouldn't. Um, and, or like gone with the wind, exactly. You know, citizen Kane, Casablanca, whatever. There's some you really shouldn't touch like star Wars. Although that's always kind of rumored now that Disney has it. Um, and then there's movies that you, uh, remake and everybody's either okay with it or they end up being a failure. Like when Hitchcock's uh, psycho was remade with Vince Vaughn and people hated that. Um, so I thought about this with video games and I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Joseph, but I've always, it, it seems to me video games don't seem to have this same vibe of like an untouchable holier than thou piece of art the way some films do. Uh, because I, I actually struggled to find any game where I thought people would actually get really mad about it being remade. So like with movies, there's always an audience that's upset about it. Like, uh, we only go back a few years when Ghostbusters 2016 was effectively a remake of the original Ghostbusters and everyone mm -hmm. hated it. Now they hated it for a lot of different reasons, but even the notion of doing that was enough to make everybody upset. But if I were to sit down and read news that like, oh, Sega to remake the original Sonic the Hedgehog, I think that would be more celebrated than hated. And I, I think it's just something different in games where people are constantly okay with that. Anyway, I've said enough. Uh, I mean, it's, the original Sonic the Hedgehog, like, well, uh, assuming that you're not just talking about like something like Sonic Origins where it's a, like just an enhanced port, but like an actual yeah, like remake. Like a yeah, no, the, the Sonic remake. fandom would throw a shit fit, but that's because they were the Sonic fandom, not necessarily because Sonic One is sacred and shouldn't be remade. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about in general. I mean, there's always gonna be some weirdo who's like, oh, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't affect you. But I, I, I don't know. Like even my favorite games, like uh, it's no secret. Like my favorite games are the Shenmue games, right? And if for some reason Sega came out and said, hey, we're going to remake these from the ground up, which at one point they were actually going to do, by the way, there is even footage of it online. Um, I, I don't think anybody in the Shenmue fandom would be like genuinely upset about that. They might be surprised. They may not see why that's a priority, but I I mean, I they might be think... upset depending on how it turns out, but they're not going to be sure, upset that's the different. notion of that's, doing it. That's different. And that's what I'm trying to say is there are movies that you couldn't even announce doing that because it would just upset everybody. But with video games, I don't, you know, think that's the case. So when I originally looked at this question, you know, I was trying to think of specific games and I really just kind of came to the conclusion that I personally don't think there's any that you couldn't remake. And the only ones, and as I thought about it more, I think with video games uh, or the concept of remakes in general, you know, you there has to be a story that you find compelling enough that it was so perfectly executed the first time that why even touch it? And most video games do not possess a compelling enough story for that because it, they're obviously more meant for their gameplay. And so if you can remake them with better gameplay, that usually gets a, gives it a pass. Mm -hmm. So as I, ironic as it might sound, because it's a genre I don't even like... Uh, RPGs is probably the only one you could maybe pull from where people would go, no, the story was perfect the first time, but since that's not really, or especially JRPGs, and since that's not my arena, I can't really claim that with any knowledge, specifically firsthand. Yeah, here's here's the thing. If there was any games game that would have been that, it would have been like Final Fantasy VII, and do you know what they... 
And the oh, two remake the, the two games yeah. they made that are remaking that so far have been excellent. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it, exactly. and, and, and to be fair, I mean, I'm saying that as like just something that was like a cultural touchstone that was like the game that made a bunch of people start playing JRPGs for the first time. Obviously, for anyone who knows Final Fantasy VII, the original Final Fantasy VII, that localization had a ton of problems, and the game parts of the game have not aged as well as people remember. But, yeah, but like you're saying, like there are movies where you wouldn't, where if you mention it, people would like just be like, no, 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 what the hell? One thing, you, but like you're you're like you're saying with games, like the game games are mostly dependent on gameplay, and gameplay does not, and gameplay is something that you could very easily tell you're playing something antiquated, as opposed to like yeah, if you're watching an old movie, yeah, sure, certain shots might be. The way certain things are shot might look old, and if it has special effects, they're going to look like shit. But acting is acting is acting. Like, the fundamental thing that needs to actually be conveyed by actors has not changed since, like, since the early days of film. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I sit there and I was thinking about some of, as, you know, you're kind of rephrasing these, like, holier than thou games like final fantasy 7 you know the sacred cow type of games that a lot of people remember that wouldn't want touched and a lot of them did like you know i thought about i'm like oh metal gear solid that first one because like konami has never re-released you know as they only re-released the ps1 version they they never bothered to remake it and then i was like no what are you talking about they remade it for gamecube like <laughs> like 20 years ago the yeah. twin snakes um and i you know you look at some of these other ones like the resident evil games like oh those games are so perfect you should never touch them then they remade them and they're phenomenal. The remakes are really good. Mm-hmm. So with, with video games, it seems like no one at the core of it, nobody gets upset about the concept of remaking a game and rebuilding it. They only get upset or satisfied with the result. You can have a very good remake like the Resident Evil ones, or you can have a really bad remake. Um, although I, off the top of my head, I can't come up with a great example for that, but I guarantee they're out there. Um, and then there's reissues that are buggy. You know, that's different. I'm talking about a ground mm-hmm. up remake. You just, it doesn't seem like anybody gets upset. I, although I know a lot of people didn't like the twin snakes iteration of, uh, metal gear solid on GameCube. I don't know why I loved it, but a lot of people didn't. Um, that's probably why it hasn't been re-released. Honestly, probably. if the majority of the yeah. fan base didn't like it. Yeah. I, I, you know, there you go. So let's, I, even though I love that one, I guess I'll give that as an example of a quote unquote bad one. Um, but that's the other thing with remakes in general is uh, with films, they almost never remake a movie that was a flop, which is unfortunate because that would actually be a really good source of new content because there's a lot of great stories out there that were executed horribly once they were actually put on film, where if you went back to that same idea and remade it, you could have a fresh new movie, you just do it better. Um, but simple marketing means they want to, you know, recycle the name and the assets, the IP value, right? And unfortunately, the same applies to video games. But I do kind of wish, I I, th- I see video games as having more of an opportunity to go back and look at ideas that were good but executed poorly and then just integrate them into games and make it work. Um, but that's not exactly at the heart of the question. Uh, but I like the idea of doing more remakes. Where it gets monotonous is when you remake a game that was relatively new, like The Last of Us. Um, which yeah, why did, I don't know why people. they did an actual remake of Part 1 instead of just porting it again, honestly. Uh, probably because they thought they had to give you more bang for your buck. And because it's one of the only juggernauts that PlayStation has had in quite some time. And when I say juggernauts... I guess that's I mean, true, yeah. I, I mean, you gotta remember, like, when the PS1 era, they were cranking out franchises that broke into upper echelon pop culture, and then they kind of stopped. Uh, but Last of Us was something so big and so significant, it could get an HBO series that does well. Like, that's how significant it was. So they needed the cross synergy with a new release. And the only way to do a new release was to effectively remake a game. That was about all you could do. Um, True. That was all the only thing I could do that quickly. Which actually is an interesting point, by the way. Um, Microsoft had control of a Fallout television show, right? That's just out now that people seem to really like. And there is no new Fallout game to cross synergize with it. They did do a next-gen update for Fallout 4. They did, but, but that was a free Yeah, game. but there was no new game. 
Yeah, which is insane now that you think about that. Because it almost came off like what Microsoft was trying to do was have a TV show with the kind of success that Last of Us had on Sony's end. And they didn't bother to do a game. And I'll give Sony some credit in hindsight because they were smart enough to know, yeah, it's not that interesting to remake the first game, but people will buy it anyway because we're going to have this show. I mean, even if you did some like complete reimagining of Fallout, I don't know, New Vegas or something... People would have been on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like anyone who would be jumping into Fallout from the from the show. I mean I mean from the show wouldn't have given a crap about like Bethesda Bethesda's output and like like oh Bethesda made Starfield and everyone who played Bethesda games didn't like Starfield, you know, paraphrasing um, on that one, but like no one who was coming in who's coming in from the Fallout show would care. On the other hand, maybe they figured, you know, we have all the Fallout games on Game Pass, so people could just immediately see the show and be like, "Oh, cool! This show is awesome." You, you, wait, what do you mean? There's like four games I could just go jump in and play right now. Maybe they were thinking that would happen. But did they advertise in that logic? I mean, I don't, I don't remember seeing like any ads or anything like that. Well, but. there you go. See, that that's my point. Like, if they had advertised in that logic, hey, you like Fallout the show? We got them all over here on Game Pass with free updates. Like, that would have been a thing. But as far as I know, that was never a, a, any sort of marketing move on their end. But whatever. No. Nah. Um, one thing you got to consider though, in going back to this question about games to remake, is uh, I have noticed, it, particularly with with casual gamers is this sounds horrific to people who would listen to this podcast, but there is a substantial portion of the population whose simple answer to which games they want to play are, quote, the ones with the best graphics. And what that means is they're not going to care if you remake anything. They're just going to want it to, quote, unquote, look the best. And so that's why that audience is the one that's the reason you get Last of Us remade, like, only shortly after it was originally made. Um, And I just... I just don't I just don't think there are any sacred cows in gaming history where you just know nobody should ever remake that. That game was absolutely perfect and there's nothing that could be done to change it and it's it would be a, you know, sacrilege to touch it. I think that even the most diehard of fan bases always embraces new content with their games. Um, it's, it just doesn't have the same tone that movies do. Like if you, again, if you talk back and look at movies or look back at movies, look at star Wars, right? So star Wars, the original trilogy, the George Lucas versions, the original ones, um, everybody thought, you know, it was the greatest movies ever. And then when he basically did like a firmware update for them, you know, the special editions, People hated that and still complain about, you know, uh, Han shot first and all that sort of stuff. Why did we need digitally inserted Ewoks and all that sort of thing? And people don't like changes to films. Uh, and and that's when the film. same and that's when the original author or or to or director is doing it. Yeah. And when it's known that he didn't like how the original ones came out as well. Like, it's not like a case of he just like did it for money. He, he very much like there was things I saw about him being very, very upset with the movies as they came out, like, with what they were able to do. It right. just so happens is that, like, the changes he made for the special editions just turned out to make it worse. In a lot of ways. I, but, I mean, some of the changes were actually better. It's just you have to... I don't think he appreciated that they were considered a, you know, a piece of art to people that you shouldn't update. But that's kind of my point. We live, I mean, we're used to our games getting updated. We were literally talking about games. You yourself mentioned ones, oh, this game needs to be supported for a few years. What does support mean? It means updates. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just a very different mentality to that type of art. That's why you'll always get people who are like, you know, into video game preservation and history, but that, you know, want to preserve things for the future. But even like, I'm one of them. I don't sit there and go, like, I have to preserve every single version of this game, every single, you know, build of it. I just kind of care about whatever was considered the final version. Um, yeah. It's it's just kind of a different mentality. And therefore, because it's a an art form that is constantly expected to be persistently updated, I just don't think there's a single game out there that you just are never allowed to touch. I mean... There isn't, yeah. I, I, you know, I sit here and I think about, like, if right now, 
we saw a tweet or something like that from Universal Studios saying they were going over Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis' head and they're going to make a new Back to the Future movie. It's going to star Tom Holland as a new Marty McFly and he's going to drive around a time-traveling Tesla. We would all be really, really mad. We would all not like that. That would be bad. We would hate it. We would know exactly how terrible it was going to be and that it was a waste of our time. However, if Nintendo turned around and tweeted and said... We're going to take Super Mario World, this like iconic, amazing game, and we're going to do a complete 3D build of it for the Nintendo Switch, like that uh, Legend of Zelda DX game they did a few years ago for the Switch. Mm -hmm. We would all be like, oh my god, this is great. And I think it's just because video games and movies do not work the same way in that no. magic. So, I guess that's all I really have to say on that, unless you have anything else to contribute to it. Nope, I'm pretty good. All right, well, then we will move on. So thank you very much, Spencer, for that subject. Uh, now we are at the phase in which we have a round of shout-outs. All the following people are Patreon backers who have subscribed uh, that allow the show to continue, and we appreciate you. That we got Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, and Trey Wagner. Once again, that's Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega Steve, and Trey Wagner. Uh, if you're out there and you would like to support the show, get a shout-out, pick a subject, or even be on here at any time, you can join up on the Patreon. We appreciate the support. Thank you so much. And we are back. Uh, we were going to be joined by uh, Abdullah, but we are actually joined by our returning champion, Joseph. It's been a Hi, long time. Hi, I'm back. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really nice to see you, man. What's been going on? Um, mm. No, but in all, in all seriousness, guys, Abdullah was going to be here, but he had to cancel last minute due to a family uh, emergency, and uh, Joseph was cool enough to pitch in here. So, Joseph, thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Um, so, what we're going to do, though, uh, so Abdullah had selected uh, actually a couple of subjects here, and we'll just talk about them on his behalf, I guess. So, thank you, Abdullah, for contributing that, and I hope everything works out in uh, your particular situation. Um, so, we'll just start it off here. He wrote down franchises that have better games than their movie series or comic adaptations and vice versa so my interpretation of this would be uh basically like was there ever you know a, a movie that was like okay but it actually turned out to have a really good game or you know i guess vice versa if you want to think about movies that were good and they had you know or movies that were bad and they had great games uh, or great you know you know what i'm trying to say so um yeah do, do you have any that come to mind mm. Honestly, uh, not really. Um, so, I have one, but it's it's kind of the, the, the gold standard answer, no pun intended, Goldeneye. Uh, I love that game for the N64. I never really liked the movie, but I'm also not much of a James Bond guy in general, but that game, like, transcended that, where I always... Oh, that right, was awesome. yeah, that was a, that was a license. Exactly. <laughs> People tend to forget that. That one was like, it yeah. just seems like this, it's its own separate thing, but it was actually just a quick tie in game for a movie. I mean, that is probably the definitive example because uh, not only did it basically make the N64 in a lot of ways, it revolutionized first person shooters. Uh, all the casuals uh, of, you know, that concept were suddenly into it. Like, I am not a James Bond guy, never was. I've seen quite a few of the movies. Never particularly liked them. I don't really know why. They, a lot of it should, but I, I you know, I don't. Uh, but that game, I loved it. it. I didn't even care that it wasn't. It was based on a character I didn't really care much for. I remember seeing the movie once and thinking it was dreadful. But uh, no, I, I, I love that video game. Yeah, I don't I mean, remember so anything the about the movie really. Yeah, I mean, I mean, granted, game, I don't remember much about the game either because I didn't grow up with an N sixty four. But ah, fair enough. I but did actually, actually play it and. The game is what we still talk about. Precisely. Yeah, the game actually does pretty pretty accurately-ish follow the plot of the movie. So I'll give them that, um, you know, for, for what it's worth. But, I mean, that game was a special case for a lot of reasons. I mean, that was a true lightning in a bottle thing. I mean, the whole game was made in just a few weeks. I think the um, multiplayer mode was actually developed in only two weeks. Uh, which is like the thing it's best known for, which ironically wasn't my thing for it. But, you know, it became this licensing nightmare. And of course, it took, you know, what, 20 years before we were able to get a reissue of it over on uh, Switch and Xbox uh, because it got split into multiple owners. So it's it's it definitely is a unique story in that case. But uh, I don't I can't really think of any in the reverse where like usually video game movies are famously bad. Uh, and there, I can't think of a situation where you had like some, 
great or really bad video game that made a really good movie. Oh, okay. Or vice yeah. versa. No. The, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, Yeah, like, you, you could argue, I, I mean, people could probably argue that, like, The Last of Us TV series might be better than the game. I can't say that for sure, because I've only played the original release of the game, and I never watched the show. But, yeah. I mean, that game is, like, pretty much already a playable movie that just has, like, actual gameplay segments in it, instead of, like... Um, what you got with like Heavy Rain or any Quantic Dream game or like Until Dawn, where sure. it's ba- where it's basically quick time events and then the rest of it is just plot. But like if you remove the gameplay segments of The Last of Us and then just like put in a few more like cutscenes or whatever to like bridge the gap that the gameplay had for the most part, you'd basically have a good super long movie. Which I mean yeah, is obviously the case because there was a successful HBO show. That we talked about earlier, but we I haven't actually seen it, so I can't say if it's better. Same. But. And that applies to the Fallout show as well, as we discussed before. Well, the Fallout show is also an interesting case, because that one is like, yeah, it's a Fallout show, but it's ca- canonical to the games. Like, it's not a repeat of any of the game's plots. Really? That I did not Yeah, that, that's something I heard, and I was like, hmm, huh. that's interesting. See... Beyond that, I think you have to start getting into very like obscure answers. Like like I said, the I think the the gold standard answer would be Goldeneye. If you want to look at more modern examples, like what you're saying makes sense. But after that, you have to start looking at things like, do you remember the the Todd McFarlane character Spawn? Vaguely. Okay, so it's like this big you know demon from hell type of guy, whatever. And so he's had a theatrical film. He's had comic books. He's had toys. He's been uh, in Soul Calibur too. Yeah, he's been in Soul Calibur 2. Exactly. Yes, that's the character. But he also had standalone video games. Like, there's a Dreamcast game made by Capcom that's his. And I've heard that game's actually pretty good. I haven't played it since it came out, so I don't really remember that well. But um, I think you would have to start getting go down that type of rabbit hole where you go like, yes, the Dreamcast game of Spawn is going to be better than that 90s movie Spawn uh, with um, John Leguizamo and other guys. Um if I recall correctly, you ever see the Dark Knight, the Batman movie? Yes. Okay. Do you remember at the beginning when like the mafia guys are all sitting around and they're trying to come up with like a plan on how to defeat Batman and Joker walks in and says he'll kill him? Mm-hmm. All right. Do you remember there is the one dude who basically, as soon as Joker gets in, he's like, what's to stop me from having my boy here rip your head off? And then uh, he tells him like, you know, you wouldn't take a nickel for your grandma. And the guy gets up and he goes, enough from the clown. Do you remember that guy? No. The, well, it was a black dude. He's, I think he's wearing a purple suit, and he basically just yells at the Joker. V- vaguely. I mean, I haven't seen the movie since for, in years, so. Well, f- for those who have, that guy is, I believe, the actor who played Spawn. <laughs> so, like, you don't see him in a whole lot of stuff. Um, but th- that was where all it was going with it, is like, yeah, whatever. Um Yes, I think Spawn would be, like, my secondary answer. Because I'm, like, I'm looking around this the, the room I'm in right now, and I'm looking at, like, some video games that maybe had movies, like Final Fantasy, right? Like, the Final Fantasy movie is kind of decent, but it has, like, nothing to do with Final Fantasy uh, as a franchise. There was a know, sequel man, like, movie to Final Fantasy VII that came out afterwards, but it's not better than the game. Right, but it's also not the theatrical film I'm talking about, the one from, like, 2000 or whatever it was. Oh, it was, like... The motion yeah, capture the, spirit, the spirits within, yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. But, um, yeah. Uh, I, I, they, that, they tried to make a Final Fantasy that was a movie instead of a game, and it didn't really work out that well. Yeah. I feel like Abdullah probably had some answers in his pocket for this, but I probably. mean, GoldenEye's the obvious one, yeah. But, like I said, you'd have to go into some obscure territory, like Spawn is, again, a perfect example, where his games are probably better than some of his other media. Uh, and I guarantee there's going to be other examples of that. But, like, if Abdullah was here, I guess I would ask him, like, does the character or, you know, IP have to originate in video games? Or does it originate in other areas and then they just happen? Like Spider-Man, right? Spider-Man has had some really bad TV shows and some really good video games. But then he's also had really good movies and, you know, <laughs> good Very TV bad shows. video games. Yes, exactly. So it's like, you can, basically you can cherry pick the answer based on the character. You take any most popular IP of any kind, there are going to be 
elements of it that are better on both platforms. Like, there are Star Wars games that are phenomenal and better than some of these terrible Star Wars Disney-era movies. But when I say that that... Exactly. Battlefront (laughs) is better than, say, Rise of Skywalker. But at the same time... A new hope is still a new hope, you know. So it's like I guess you'd have to yeah, draw. Yeah, like some in the case of Spider Man, the spy, the PlayStation Spider Man and Spider Man Two games are better than, or probably better than the Amazing Spider Man movies. Yes, exactly, exactly my point. So it's like basically, where do you draw that line? And the truth is, I don't really know. Like um, Ninja Turtles, great example. Ninja Turtles has some awesome video games, but it also has had some terrible movies and terrible shows. But it has had some very good video games. I think as recently, that's actually a good answer now that I think about it. Because like um, that one, Shredder's Revenge, that's not too not too old. I beat that all the way through. That was really good. Obviously, it had the Genesis and uh, SNES era stuff. That's all very good. Arcade, while also suffering from those Michael Bay era movies. But you guys get mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say. It's just like there are definitely characters uh, and IPs that have had better games than they have had movies and TV shows. And but I think a lot of the time you're either going to have to go into kind of obscure stuff or you can just if you're willing to just kind of have more of a blanket philosophy, you could pretty much take any major franchise that exists on all mediums and cherry pick and say, yes, this particular piece of Batman content is better than this particular piece of Batman content on a totally different entertainment medium. You know what I mean? Yeah. All right. So hopefully that somewhat sufficiently answers that. Uh, do you have anything else? Do you have any other examples you can think of? Not really. Like, I'm sure if we thought about it for a while, we could probably, like you said, we could cherry pick whatever. But yeah, yeah, maybe that's what he wanted to do. But I, I don't know. So, uh, but that would be my answer. If we're just going to stick to one, I'm going to go with Goldeneye because I think that's just like the obvious one. But there you go. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll just we'll just move on. So Abdullah, thank you very much for that. And actually, I'll probably ask you about this privately, like which answers you had. But uh, So we'll move on to the next one. Uh, and this subject, which is our last subject, was picked by Sinjit, who is a backer who gets to pick out a subject for us. And Sinjit, uh, ironically, he didn't actually have a subject in mind. He basically just you know, said, let us pick. Abdullah actually picked this subject as well. Um, and I thought it was perfect because Sinjit kind of likes his alternate history stories. So basically, let's just wax inane, if you will. What if the PlayStation had never got the success that it got? And I want to set that up a little bit with some context. And Joseph, you know this. You're like me. You're old and you remember these things. Mm -hmm. Um, When Sony entered the video game market initially with the PlayStation back in 1994... That was their first entrance, obviously, and we a lot of us know the debacle between you know them and Nintendo over the Nintendo PlayStation prototype and all that. But at that time, uh, when the fifth generation was happening, there were a lot of companies that just decided, hey, I can make a video game console too. And that largely happened because Sega and Nintendo, particularly Sega, had proved to the industry that you didn't have to literally be Nintendo to compete in video games. So there were all these companies, all these tech companies just trying. You know, Atari came back to make the Jaguar after sitting out the um, the fourth generation. Uh, Commodore, uh, a computer company, made the Amiga CD32. Uh, Fujitsu made the FM Towns Marty. Um, EA and Panasonic and a few others kind of collaborated to make the 3DO. You, you get what I'm saying. It was just a bunch. Apple eventually would go on to make the Pippin. So Sony was just yet another one of those random companies just trying their luck. However, to their benefit, they kind of did most things right while also capitalizing on the mistakes of their competitors. Namely, Nintendo should not have stuck with cartridges, but they did it anyway, alienating developers and increasing uh, production costs, which... They also showed up, like, two years late to the party as well. Yes, yes, they did. Um, And then Sega, who really had a golden opportunity there, just really bet incorrectly on what the fifth generation was supposed to be. Uh, The arcade market for sega was like yeah 3d stuff is the future virtual fighter is a big hit etc and that market goes well but the home console team kind of went into the saturn with the attitude that they didn't think people were quite ready for that um 
and so that they should really make a 2D console with a lot of 3D capabilities and elements. Um, and then more or less they changed their minds, but it was so far along in production, the best they could do was try to work around that limitation. And so as a result, the Saturn became very difficult to program for because you were trying to make 3D content on a system that was only at best technically capable of it, which was just a pain in the ass. And Sega did a very poor job of basically educating programmers on how to do that, where Sony didn't make either of those mistakes. They made a system that was extremely easy to develop for and it was on discs, so it was very easy to publish at low costs. Um, and and so they also the, didn't just recently abandon another 32-bit system add-on thing with well, the 32X. Sega, yeah. 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 Yeah, it, like, yeah, exactly. Unlike Sega, they didn't have the baggage of, say, Atari. Uh, they didn't have the absence of brand recognition like, say, a Commodore or a Fujitsu. Uh, or in cases Commodore, they couldn't even legally sell. The yeah, Sony no, Com Commodore <laughs> had a brand rep recognition of some sort because they were very like known as like a computer thing. But then the that like whole embargo slash judgment that they couldn't actually sell anything in the U.S. kind of killed them. Oh, that that was that was a death knell. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Or Panasonic system just being way too expensive, etc. Like. They kind of found the exact right sweet spot, and once they had that, uh, they were able to entice developers, and they really put you know put their all into it. That's the history of what happened. So if we explore the timeline where they just became another flop, you know, like what do you think happens? Um, let me let me articulate one change that might have actually made that possible. Have you ever like opened up a PlayStation? Just like open the lid. I don't mean take it apart. And notice that the shape uh, is just a little odd. Yeah, you have. Okay, so well, I, I, I think I get where you're going with this, rather. But the, it never the bigger discs. Yeah, you all right? You already know about this. I'm glad you know about this. Most people have never heard of this. So, at the time, everybody, uh, Sony had been very concerned about piracy. Uh, it was an up and coming concept, and they thought, how do we police this? And so they had actually, Sony, in, in a very Sony fashion, supposedly the story goes that they had actually developed a different type of CD, a bigger one, like in between the size of like a Laserdisc and a CD. It was just kind of like, uh, I don't know if you want to think of it as like a CD plus, it was just bigger. And if you look at your PS1, you'll notice that the disc lid area is oddly big. And that's supposedly why that was there. Um... But they eventually realized that was just going to cause too many uh, industrial production problems because machines were basically designed to one, around that specific dimension of the standard CD, which is why that dimension is still used on you know DVDs and Blu-rays and everything else that's still produced. Um, and so they ultimately had to get rid of that in favor of just the, the wobble that's inside the disc that creates copy protection, which is like good enough for the time. Um, Let's argue for a second that they just said, no, screw it. We, we're committed to this. We are actually going to put out these big jumbo discs. It wouldn't surprise me if the cases that they put out with that would have also been like a huge burden on the system. Like that was one of the big problems for the Saturn was the even though Sega used these standard discs, they put these ridiculous cases out that look really nice when they're lined up, but they break with a feather. They were hard to keep, you know. Um, in good condition. Store <laughs> shelves didn't really like them because they couldn't stack them very well. Uh, they took up a lot of real estate. And I just kind of imagine that whatever case they would have come up with for this substantially bigger disc would have created the exact same issue. So if you're then getting into pissing off retailers and also making these big discs that are harder to handle, especially for children, I, I think that that probably would have really hurt the system. And as much as it's odd to mention... Piracy was also one of the things that made the PlayStation brand popular because it was so easy to basically clone the games, particularly in like China, uh, that people just kind of got on board with that. And that's people were buying the hardware anyway. There is a reason it sold like however hundred plus million units. Uh, and it was that uh, that was a factor. So if you had this unique format, what we've kind of learned over time is that a lot of the time you have a unique format in a video game system, at least a disc-based one, 
it doesn't tend to pan out. Like, look at the the UMDs, the PSP. It's unique GameCube. entirely to that machine. Yeah, GameCube, exactly. People always just kind of mistreat it. And even with the GameCube, they at least Nintendo adhered to the dimensions of a standard mini disc. This would have been Sony's own specific size. So let's argue for a second. They actually did it, and it caused a bunch of problems, and the system ultimately was like... It was like the Virtual Boy, you know. It was a, it was cool, but it was around for a year because it just couldn't do anything right. At that point, what do you think happens? <sighs> well, there's two ways this could go. Like, it's going to either be the Sega Saturn somehow win ends up winning Gen Five, or the N sixty four wins Gen Five. That's the only real reasonable thing that could come from this because all the other ones had other issues that Sony screwing up would not potentially be able to be overcome. Like Commodore wasn't able to legally sell in the U S um, Steve jobs came back to Apple and killed every single um, Mac clone thing that was going on, which killed the Pippin. Uh, yeah. The 3DO a it was designed to fight the Genesis and SNES and B, like, the 3DO company couldn't make any money because they didn't have any licensing fees and, like, other various manufacturers were making it, so they couldn't, like, do the whole Razor Blade model, so it, it, each system cost, like, 700 bucks in 90s money. Yeah. So I decided to pull up a, a just, like, a list of every system from that generation. I, I agree with you that you're pretty much completely right, because almost every system in that generation, as odd as it sounds, was essentially exclusive to, like, one country or another. Um, you know, the, the 3DO came out, you know, it had a global release, but you know, whatever. Um, the Jaguar technically did, but barely. Um Saturn, PS1, N64, we know. But, like, the FM Towns, Marty, Japan only. Uh, the CD32 wasn't Europe only, but it basically was, like, parts of Europe only. It did get the Canadian release, but it says it didn't have an American release, whatever. Neo Geo CD, technically a fourth-gen system, but whatever. That might have done a little better if the PS1 didn't exist. But it was um, also not really trying to, to fight... PS1 and actually went and become market dominant. It was, dominant. it was supposed to be a cheaper version of the AES, which was for S SMK fighting game nerds with a shit ton of money. Uh, the PCFX is an interesting case because it only came out in Japan, and it makes me wonder if the PlayStation had failed, if maybe NEC would have tried a little harder with that system, but that's purely speculative. Although I personally don't think that that would have dominated North America since they were coming off the backs of the TurboGrafx-16, which wasn't exactly a hit here, despite it being good. You're completely right about the Pippin. Like, the Pippin came out like four years after the PS1 was a success. In fact, in this timeline, it's possible the Pippin never even gets made at all. Um... Yeah, the, and then the Pladia and the Loopy, both exclusive to Japan, and certainly were never going to be direct threats. The only one that I see a potential dark horse position in would have been the Jaguar, just because if uh, developers simply didn't exist on PS One, I agree with you completely. They would have put all their effort into the N sixty four and the Saturn. Completely agreed, and I think in that scenario. Uh, the Saturn probably takes over the role that the N64 did in our timeline, where it was good, people had it, but they only got it for like a handful of games. And the N64 probably takes over where the PS1 did in our timeline, which is uh, it was the more successful system because it was cheaper uh, and you know more developers decided to stick with Nintendo, even though they thought they were jerks because Nintendo typically means money. Um, basically developers would have had to choose between expensive production costs of the, the media itself, meaning the cartridge or a disc, or they would have had to choose between, uh, affordable development costs because ex developing stuff for the Saturn would in most cases yeah. be more expensive than it would for the N64. So you kind of have to pick your poison. Um, and then I think that would have put the Jaguar in the interesting Sega Saturn position in our timeline, where it's like that third one that people don't think about as much, and it could have probably well, had more of a following. But that yeah, the Jaguar would have would have been in the position of the loser of the generation 
with the asterisks of it's the loser of the generation that people actually remember. Precisely. And it would have suffered the problem of both of those systems and then some because it's still cartridges. It's also extremely difficult to program for. Uh, and it would be the least powerful of the three. So it's, it really has no advantages there. Mm-hmm. Um, though in that timeline, I would imagine the Jaguar CD would have stood more of a chance of being somewhat successful. Um, but I, I agree with you completely that you're looking at a situation where uh, one of those two wins. And we can, in our timeline, we have to remember that in reality, uh, the Sega Saturn actually defeated the N64 in Japan. What we might be looking for without a PS1 in Japan is the Saturn utterly slaughtering the N64 to the point of irrelevance. And that cannot be understated. Oh, um, God, yeah. That would have uh, given Sega enough money to keep the Dreamcast going, probably. Dude, if anything, it would have pretty much guaranteed Saturn support in the Dreamcast. Also uh, that. Because because not only would it have been like absolutely essential in Japan, it would have also been like, well, the Saturn was enough of a hit here that we can get away with that. So you're probably looking at a far superior version of the Dreamcast capable of Saturn support. Um, I don't know what Nintendo would have done, though. As far as, like, the GameCube equivalency, I imagine that would have been a pretty different machine because it wouldn't have been trying to uh, compete so much with either PS1 or what we eventually would know as the PlayStation 2. So they probably would have done... I don't know. Do you think they would have held on to cartridges still? If if they succeeded, possibly, but it could have just gotten to the point where it's like, no, cartridges are just going to be too expensive to make anything worthwhile at this point. Yeah, I, I don't know. that That's where it gets really weird to me. Because, like, Sega, I have a better understanding of what they probably yeah. would have done. But Yeah, Nintendo... like, if Sega, if Saturn wins in the U.S. in this scenario, then no. that They definitely don't stick to cartridges in that case. Yes. Yeah. Um, but if Nintendo's the one that wins, like, if they could actually get the tech to work well enough and not be stupidly expensive, or if they're... Or because, you know, their system's successful and they don't have the oh, we screwed up mentality going into the GameCube, or sort of, that they sort of had, they might try doing the cartridges anyway, even though they're ridiculously expensive at that point to do a six-gen game on. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree with you. I I think they would have probably switched to some... I mean... That's the other thing is you have to take into account that part of the creation of DVD as technology came from Sony and the drive to eventually put it into the PlayStation 2. So that technology may not have been developed. So then we don't really know. Or it might have been slower. Yeah, it might have been slower or it might have been just, you know, a different type of disc specifically. But another new way, like kind of like what Sega did with the Dreamcast, where they just basically, they made the GDR or GD-ROM, which was just gigabyte disc recordable. So it's basically a standard CD-ROM, but with like seven or 300 or so additional megabytes in it. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I do think that the industry would not have technologically jumped anywhere near as forward as it has had Sony not been there. However, I do think that it would have been, and maybe I say this naively, it would have been a little bit more about pure gaming for a longer time because I yeah. don't think, I don't think Atari, Sega, and Nintendo would have put us in the whole like DLC downloadable you know patches and everything route nearly as early as Sony and Microsoft put us into it. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I mean, look at Nintendo themselves, who's only starting to embrace this, you know, now. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, Sega might have, because they had some DLC stuff in the Dreamcast, but... They did, but it was all it was all minor stuff, with, I think, one exception. There's a European game called Planet Ring, which, funny enough, has always online DRM, as weird as that sounds. Uh, Fantasy Star Online, too, uh, as well. But that, that would, you can play offline if you know what you're doing. But anyway... I, I would be very curious to see that timeline. I think that they, there would have been a lot of better games, but it would have been a lot more single-player stuff. I think multiplayer stuff would have been kind of just a fun novelty that does exist in some cases. Um, 
but yeah, the industry would be very different had the PS1 flopped. And I'm going to say it very well could have if they had stuck to those beer, those big weird discs they were supposedly originally going with. Yeah, and I know like it, in, yeah. in Japan, at least, I think that things were pretty much neck and neck between PS1 and the PS1 and the Saturn until Final Fantasy VII didn't show, show up on the Saturn. Yeah, pretty much. That that was the game, I, I think you're right, that kind of eventually, I mean, blew it out of there. So, yeah, again, I'm looking at, like, a PS1 right now. And if you look at the lid, you'll notice it's abnormally big for a standard size CD. So if you just kind of imagine a disc that's only slightly smaller than that fitting in that space, that's supposedly what they were going to do. And I would argue, had they done that... We might be looking back at the PS1 the way we look back at, like, the Pippin, where it's like, remember that time Sony made a game console for a year and it had, like, 18 games on it? Yeah. This thing is called the PlayStation. Kind of a stupid uh, Okay. Name. Blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah, if, if it does that badly to only have, like, a couple of games on and fails right out of the gate, then Sega probably wins because they're probably assuming that Square... Soft still decides to make Final Fantasy VII because it's going to going to be the only viable system to put it on at that point. That's that's what I'm curious about because I I genuinely think we would have had a developer civil war of sorts where you genuinely have publishers fighting with their dev teams. Dev teams are like, look, Saturn's nice and all, but it's really hard to develop games for because they want us to make modern day content that we can't really put on that system without an incredible amount of effort. But then from a publication standpoint, it's just a simple matter of pressing a disc. And then Nintendo has the exact opposite problem. But well, but, in the case of like something like Final Fantasy VII, like when the, that game came out and the way it came out and the way it was made with, like, all the full motion video and stuff that they want, tech they wanted to use, they would not have been able to put that on the N64 at all. I believe flat you. Out. I, be I, I believe you. Uh, you know that game better than I do. I'm just making a point that I think from an industry standpoint, they would have all been kind of fighting internally. However, I will also say this. Without the PS1 making it both affordable and easy to embrace what we know now as fifth-generation, like, 3D uh, capabilities... I'm going to argue that the average game that we think of that generation in may not have had nearly as much drive to be produced. In other words, probably not. Probably w Sega's original vision of like 2D with 3D elements probably would have panned out more. Uh, the only reason they were making 3D content is because they were under pressure to do so because their games looked archaic compared to the PlayStation and to a lesser extent the N64. Um, now, to Nintendo's credit, they probably would have been less guilty of that only because they you as you were right they would have had their system literally came out almost two years after the saturn i'm looking at the exact dates the japanese saturn came out november 22nd 1994 uh and it the japanese n64 was june 23rd 1996 so it had about a year and a half of additional development time um and if there is no ps1 that means Nintendo can make certain changes. Hell, Nintendo could have ultimately decided to release a CD-based system, for all we know. And if they had done that, that's that that would have been huge for Nintendo. Oh yeah, for sure. So it's it's too hard to say exactly which what goes what way, but I agree with you in in for sure that that generation would have been at the very least decided by Sega and Nintendo. Only one of them could win. There, that's that's what would have happened. Atari might have been able to hit a nice distant third place enough that they maybe even would have made another system after that. Um, yeah, like, and which Xbox sort of never comes into existence. Likely not, because Xbox's original motivation for this was that these things were becoming too much like computers, and if Sony's not there, that likely doesn't worry Microsoft anymore. At least yeah. not nearly as much. Um, not as quickly, so anyway. Yes, precisely. So, I don't know. It would have been a very different timeline. Uh, and I, I do like the idea, maybe as an April Fool's video one day, doing a PS1 retrospective as if it's something like the Pippin. Like, anybody remember this thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just, I don't know enough if enough people would get the joke. But mm -hmm. <laughs> that'd be kind of fun. A lot of people but, um, would probably think you went crazy. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, anyway, 
Uh, anything else you can think of about this? Any other points you would like to make? Like any other things you think would be either cool because they could have potentially happened or, you know, things that it would really suck that they never happened because of this. Mm. I mean, well, I guess without Xbox, I mean, the whole gap between PC gaming and console gaming would be still intact as opposed to them basically being the same thing, except that on one, you can have the option of using a keyboard and the other one, but like nowadays, most games come out on PC and also come out on both consoles and they're exactly the same. Like, unless, unless if it's like a game like Stellaris, which does come, did come out on console, but they had to basically change how it plays because it's, the normal interface would not work on a system where you don't have a mouse and a keyboard, but they managed to make it work on, on Xbox and on PlayStation. So, so but. what you're saying is it would have been more interesting because we would have had more unique gaming experiences. Got it. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever we, we obviously don't live in that timeline, but it is fascinating to reminisce and think about it. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess that'll do it then. So a uh, huge shout out to Sinjeet specifically for, he didn't actually pick that subject, but that was his subject all the same. Uh, and Abdullah for actually picking it as well as, you know, picking the previous, I hope you do well, buddy. I uh, hope everything turns out. Okay. I want to give additional shout outs to Loke, Michael Kelly, Sega, Steve, and Trey Wagner, as well as Spencer Purrier and Joseph, obviously to you. Thank you for joining me. And of course, coming in for round two out of nowhere. Welcome. Appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, appreciate it. Um, and to anybody else out there, Patreon backers, if you wish to join, again, you get early access to this as well as all my videos, and you keep the channel supported, again, you can do that. You can get shout outs, you can pick subjects, you can be on the podcast, or you can just, you know, donate a small amount just to support the channel. Appreciate all that. So, as always, guys, if you could check out the description, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, obviously Patreon, my Spreadshirt. If you want to buy, like, merch, uh, there's my travel channel. I appreciate that as well. And obviously, do me a favor, like this video, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't done that before. And uh, that'll do it, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all later.